Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th and final round. Right hand, Golovkin steps in and down he goes again. Unbelievable. Mayweather makes him pay. What a rookie mistake. A sensational left hook by De La Hoya. It's facts. I'm the best. You know what I mean? I sometimes I don't want to believe in myself, but it's the truth. I'm the best. I'm going to show you how great I am. From Southern California, this is the Last Round Podcast. Episode 75 of the Last Round Podcast. We are doing it remotely again, right, Mike? Uh, since it's we're still obviously in the quarantine world, um, you know, doesn't seem like there's going to be an end in sight. What, what do you think, Mike? Don't say that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can go back to normal by Friday. Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty <laughs> nice. That'd be pretty nice. But uh, once again, guys, thank you very much for listening to the Last Round Podcast. Um, whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, Boxing Socials, YouTube, uh, which is our new partner, um, we appreciate it. Um, so obviously, we're still trying to deliver content for you guys um, during these times. Everybody's stuck at home, so we're trying to deliver some entertainment for you guys and get on the most intriguing guests in the sport of boxing. And this week is no different in terms of intriguing guests. Uh, one of the veteran referees in the game, uh, he's obviously mostly in the California Commission, um, but he's refereed all over the world. Um, and I'm sure even if you're – we get a lot of hardcore boxing fans here obviously listening um, who 99% of them should know exactly who you are. Jack Reese uh, joins us this week. Thanks a lot for joining us, Jack. Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you know, obviously off the top, off the top here, uh, how are you holding up during uh, this, uh, you know, crazy time in this world right now? I'm actually doing really good. Um, thank, thanks to my wife and stuff. It's given me, you know, there's always something good that comes out of something bad. Mm-hmm. And the nice part is we're spending more time together than we ever did in the last 36 years. <laughs> Cooking together, exercising together, cleaning up and, uh, you know, just doing things together that we haven't done. And also, I'm very involved with other aspects of boxing other than just refereeing. I actually teach for the – I'm one of the two certified referee uh, instructors in the world for the ABC. So okay. I've always got classes coming up. And I, I'm putting – because of the demand myself, I asked Pat Russell. You guys know Pat Russell? Right, right. And, you know, to assist me, we're going to kind of branch out on our own and offer a referee's course – to um, that we teach, we just taught in uh, Vancouver a couple months ago. To anybody who wants to take it, it, it's good for like a brand new guy. It's good for media; they want to learn more about boxing, and it's good for the seasoned guy who wants to up his game. Uh, we're we're going to show you a roadmap of how to do things. You don't necessarily have to do it our way, but it's a damn good roadmap, and it's tried and tested with all the mistakes we made. You know? <laughs> so I'm busy. I'm really busy. And then look, I get the opportunity to do this stuff uh, with guys like yourself and. Uh, I get to talk boxing. It's great. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And then uh, is there like a website that people could go to, to like learn more about that endeavor that you have? Absolutely. The web, the website isn't done yet. Uh, I can tell you that the, everything's forthcoming. I'm going to put it out all the social media once the, the website's done. But I can tell you if anybody wants to make plans, we had it scheduled for June 25th and 26th, but obviously that's not going to happen. So right. the new dates are going to be Labor Day uh, weekend, September 4th, 5th, and 6th. It's going to be a three-day course, very intensive, 26 hours worth of in-class and in-ring training. It's going to be out here in Ventura at the Four Point Sheridan, and then we're going to use Robert Garcia's old gym that Igus Klimas oh, wow. owns with Kovalev and Lomachenko and all those guys training there. Right. We're going to take it over on Sunday, have two rings going at the same time. Hired, I'm going to hire some boxers to come down and walk through the scenarios, and we're going to give the guys the ring mechanics. And uh, you get a lot in 26 hours, and you can beat <laughs> up when you're done. I can tell you that. Hey, that sounds sweet. That sounds sweet. I'm sure uh, I'm sure you'll get a lot of people wanting to join. And then, obviously, when you got everything set, uh, you can – give us a ring and we'll, we'll promote it for you and help you out as well. So I would love that. that would really be great. Uh, actually just email it to, I got Michael's email. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can just send it over and we can I help you out. It. That is really nice. Of you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So, so Jack, you know, uh, I, let's just start from like for, for, for boxing fans who obviously know you are, but they don't know your, your background and how you got to this point. Um, you know, we know your background. I mean, we've been, covering the sport for a long time we've been fans of the sport for a long time we're 
obviously hardcore boxing fans but you know to the casual boxing fan who might be watching this who might be listening uh tell us how you got into the game of boxing and and pretty much how you, how you came to be who you are well i you know i've always loved boxing my uh, dad used to encourage my brother and i to to box all the time he was two years older than me and we used to actually put multiple pairs of socks on our hands <laughs> and go at it and the fight went in when one of us cried or one of us got a bloody nose so it didn't go too long because that happened really quick and then as i got older you know i did a lot of that kind of stuff with gloves in the street with a bunch of guys i grew up in new york and uh, brooklyn and the coney island section of brooklyn and a uh, great neighborhood to grow up in not the easiest to grow up in and if you uh didn't learn how to defend yourself or at least stand up for yourself uh it might not have been so pretty and, and i always loved how it felt when win or lose i stood up for myself so i, I you know i went into uh that area of boxing and stuff and when i was about I was a kid playing ice hockey in a travel league, and I lacked I lacked skill, but I wasn't afraid to go in the corner and come out with the puck, and no matter what happened in there, and I got in a lot of fights. <laughs> so I, I looked for a boxing gym, and the only boxing gym that was near me was Gleason's, and that, mm-hmm. for a kid, you know, 14 years old, 13, that was like a 40-minute train ride one way, right. and came home at 9, 10 o'clock at night. It just wasn't feasible. So I strolled into a martial arts studio with a very famous guy named Louis Neglia. Mm-hmm. And I started taking martial arts with him and I actually learned how to punch and learned how to get balance and learned the, the science behind uh, offense and defense. And then it, it turned into, you know, seven, eight years later, it turned into a, a full blown amateur uh, kickboxing events and stuff like that. And then um, I, came, I, I was uh, getting older and, you know, mm-hmm. it was time for me to get on my way because. I uh, lacked talent in the kickboxing. <laughs> My nickname was Canvas Ass. So no, was, it, was it really? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I had a a lot of things, uh, good and bad, in the <laughs> ring and stuff like that. I busted my jaw in three places, sparring once, and just I, I did it. It was a lot of gym wars where I was. It was great, and I and once you have that in you, that love of competitiveness, one on one testing yourself against another man. And I'm going to tell you something. I'll never forget. I got in shape for this kickboxing match and I was in such incredible shape. I was actually hurting guys in sparring. He would throw three guys at a time with the guys who were training for a fight, two rounds with each guy, you know, do six rounds for a three round fight. Mm -hmm. And I was hurting guys and I felt great. And then I, it dawned on me. Wow. What if this guy I'm fighting is in the same condition as me? This is going to be ugly, man. (laughs) And it really takes a lot of huevos yeah. That's why I never call a fighter a bum. It takes a lot of huevos to get in that ring, right. knowing what you're up against. So then, anyway, make a long story short, um, I came out to California to rest a little bit from a, f- a bout I had. I uh, hurt my foot, my right foot, and I just needed to get my shit together, and I needed to get on with my life. And I, 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 one thing led to another, and I got on the LAFD. I, got on, I became an L.A. City fireman. That was great. And then, oh, and then um, I did 31 years with them. And they had competition uh, in all kinds of sports. We have a police fire Olympics that we do locally, and we do a world police and fire games. That's great. And I played hockey for the um, for the team, and I also boxed in a tournament, the LA uh, Fire Department against the LA County Sheriffs and LAPD. And I was gonna, I wasn't gonna pass up an opportunity to play <laughs> cop or a sheriff. I had to do it, you know. So uh, all kidding aside, I love cops. And, and stuff. Right, right, kidding. absolutely, absolutely. But I got to compete in there, and in fact, some of my closest friends now that work on the commission with us as the inspectors, and some of them we've converted into referees. Mm-hmm. Started out the same place I did with the, you know, police fire Olympic right. stuff like that, and then Pat Russell and myself and a few other guys who were ex cops, firemen, and military. We were refing for the World Police and Fire and the, the Battle of the Badges because, you know, we're going to look out for those guys. They got to go back to work on the Monday. Yeah. We made some great friends and we took those guys in. They became inspectors. And I don't know if you know um, Ivan Guillermo at LAPD and Rudy mm-hmm. Barragon. Rudy yeah. used to be right. Chavez, uh, Julio Cesar Chavez and Oscar De La Hoya's partner. He was oh. a fantastic amateur. Right. And um, 
and he knows everything. Just ask him. He'll tell you. And uh, <laughs> if you – that was a joke, but you didn't get it. <laughs> I did it. It went over my head. It went over my head. <laughs> Rudy knows everything. Just ask him. He'll tell you. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask him. <laughs> we, we put him on as a referee. They're doing great. Their careers are going good. And our lead inspector right now is a former lieutenant with the L.A. County Sheriff's who fought – one of the same nights I did, we were in the dressing room together, not against each other. Right. His name is Mark Relier. So we got a lot of guys, police, military, fire in there as inspectors and referees and stuff. What do, you, you go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, what do you think? Something that you learned in your fire and your firefighter career that you, you were able to translate into as a boxing referee in, in, in a professional sport like that? Uh, well, I'm very fortunate, you know, being a fireman, we are all in the Los Angeles city area. We are all EMTs and we, and me, when I promoted through the ranks and became a captain, I was the captain on a paramedic engine for 20 years. So I went to a lot of shootings, stabbings, beatings, fires, car accidents, where there was trauma on people. So I got comfortable beside with my EMT skills and I always had a medic around me. So I'd always ask questions and related to boxing. And I got very, very comfortable with understanding trauma. Also reading body language. That's really assisted me in the ring when I have a fighter that gets dropped. And when he gets up, how he's going to respond. But more importantly, when they get cracked and they're getting beat up and they're in trouble, what they're doing, what's their body language do I need to get in there even without a knockdown and stop the fight? So it's taught me a lot about learning, getting a baseline on the fighter, what's normal for him, and watching the slow progression of, I'm going to try to get this on the screen, damage yeah. as he falls away from his baseline to a point where I feel like he can no longer able, he's no longer able to intelligently defend himself. Mm -hmm. And the, the stuff I got from the fire department was paramount. It, it, I feel like it gives me a leg up and a comfortability that I, I love. What was the first fight that you actually ref? Okay, I, I know you start like in the amateur level and you kind of work your way up, you know, up the ranks and stuff. But what was the first fight, at least in terms of like, like a shock to you, where you're just like, oh wow, I'm actually here in between these two guys on television. When when you really felt it? Well, it, it's a process. So I got to tell you, the very first pro fight I did, I realized this was no game. In my second pro card, not the first fight or. I right. think it, two or three or two on one card. But the second time, time I worked, I got booed by 7,000 people. And I really, <laughs> you know, welcome to the NFL. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So, um, but you know, there's a, it's, it was a long process for me to get on. And it wasn't like I just stepped out of one place and into another. So I was, I was ready and I knew what I was supposed to do just like other guys and the seriousness of it. And having the, the fact that I was, punched in the face quite a bit in my lifetime in a lot of different arenas. Uh, and that's just with my wife at home. You know? <laughs> um, it gave me actually, it gives you a better understanding of what these guys are going through, how far to take them out without letting them get hurt. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, reading the body language, man, it, it makes a world of difference. And if we get into this a little bit, I'll demonstrate to you. It's not only reading the body language, it's able. It's being able to articulate it to someone who maybe is a casual fan and doesn't understand it, mm -hmm. uh, because you get questioned. You know, in the old days, when the referee stopped the fight, they'd say, "Hey, how come he stopped that fight?" Right. And he go, "That guy took enough. I seen enough." You know. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not good enough anymore with social media and the amount of scrutiny we're all under. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to articulate what you saw so the fans understand. Because the more people we can get to understand, the greater the box, the eyes on boxing will be. Jack, can you just tell us the process for you from the classroom to the pro ranks? Yes, and I, I don't want to tell you guys, you know, the normal process would be to start in the amateurs, but I was uh, I was fortunate uh, when I decided to do this, and let me say this, I, I wanted to do this years prior, but for whatever reason, that inner voice talked me out of it a million times. I don't know why, but it did, and I finally said, you know what, I'm going to do this. And I didn't apply till I was in my 30s, my late 30s. And the process uh, was I just happened to hit upon the first and only time the California State Athletic Commission had a referee training class. And it was a three-year process. 
uh, 102, I think, or 98 or something, guys and gals applied. Mm-hmm. And when we were done, nine people made it. The process was you went to classroom uh, sessions once every two or three weeks for a year with the likes of uh, Lou Filippo, Marty Denkin, oh, wow. Robert Bird, um, and really great referees. They brought guest speakers in, like Chicken Eater Hernandez, oh, and wow. guys to speak to us what a fighter was looking for from a referee and give us stories about the seriousness of um, you know what we got to take in the ring. Then we uh, in those in that first year, attitude or missing a class or just total ineptness, you were gone. It got weeded out so fast you wouldn't believe it. There was a guy, I'm not going to mention his name on camera. Uh, <laughs> you guys off camera. Right, right. In between us. There was a lot of nepotism in that class. Mm-hmm. I remember sitting next to this gal I met, and she looks at me and she goes, is it okay if I curse? <laughs> is it okay if I curse? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, thought you were, I thought that was a part oh, of the story. <laughs> tapped me and she goes, so who's your father? Because you looked around that classroom when it was all the guy's kids. Right. Jenkins kids, Richard Steele's kids, uh, Jenkins, all these, all their kids or relatives or bankers or friends. And I said, no one. I go, who's yours? And she goes, no one. And I said, we're fucked. <laughs> you, know you, are, you know, because no connect. that's what it was like. But you know right. what? Those guys, God bless them. And that athletic commission, they weeded those guys out. And some of the kids didn't think they had to show up because their dads, whatever. And they were gone. And they were gone from the course, so it was it was uh, it was pretty good. Oh, oh, so the first year was that classroom session, and after about three or four months, about maybe five six meetings, they started breaking us off into groups with a mentor slash referee, and he would take us in the gym and have us in the ring with the guys while they were sparring and training for their fights. So I got to get in the ring with Coprita Gonzalez, Shane Mosley, uh, all these guys, Rudy Hernandez, uh, uh, Chicken Eater Hernandez, uh, Oscar De La Hoya. It was, it was insane. Shane Mosley a, a whole right. bunch of times. And uh, um, Santa Cruz, uh, mm-hmm. the older brother. And I remember when Jose, uh, Jose and uh, Leo were just little kids, man, <laughs> they were on the ring while their brothers were training. It was unbelievable. And I was in the ring with their brother quite a bit. Reggie Johnson, uh, Kenny Norton was training him. And, you know, we'd be walking around in a goofy bow tie and blue shirt during sparring. And Kenny Norton would grab your pants and not let you go. But, I mean, the memories were unbelievable. Unbelievable. No. So then, <laughs> um, so that went on for a year. And all along the way, every weekend or every week that you were there, like I said, a couple times a month, you had to take a, a little written quiz. Failure to quiz, you were out. And at the end of the year, you had to declare if you're a ref or a judge or both. In California, when you ref, you have to judge. You, you're, you're both. So I declared both, and um, that really weeded out a lot of guys. And then they put us in the ring with two of the referees acting as fighters, and they had a routine that they were going to go through. And you stayed in a room alone. You couldn't watch anybody else. And they, you know, really put a lot of pressure on you. And when you walked in there, they had all the other ref, not the other referees. You were um, training to be peers. They had seasoned referees, Bob Bird, Rob, you know, Pat Russell, all these guys grading you. And you had to act as if you walked into the arena and what you're going to do, you got to check the ring. You got to, you know, do all the things that you need to do. Then you get in and you have the two fighters. So you got to go and you got to check the gloves. You got to, you know, make sure their trunks are okay. And then you had to bring them to center, start the fight. And then they threw a scenario at you. And I got to tell you, the hard part was those guys were such terrible actors because they really weren't <laughs> getting hit. So it was confusing on what, did he, did he just get knocked down or did he dive to the floor? Right. Did he get hit while he was down? Because they would swing, you know, they'd swing and they'd miss or they'd just touch him. But it all worked out. They weeded out a lot of people, and I got through. And then the second year, full year, was you worked one, possibly two fights once a month. The other season refs chipped in $25 each from their paycheck and mm-hmm. gave us money for gas money and a couple of bucks. You made about 50 bucks that night. Right. And you were on you know, probation, and you got graded. And if you didn't do good, you were out. And then the third year, we signed a waiver that – Without any question, without any arbitration, if you mess up, they just tell you, you're no good, you're out, and you wow. can't fight it. And then they started slowly working you into the rotation on four and six rounders, 
and you got graded by an evaluator and you know, here we are 22 years later. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it's, it sounds like it's a very, you know, strenuous process to go through. It was, and I wish it was back. I wish they had it now. It's part of the problem with, with ref, you know, boxing. We have sanctioning bodies. We have, uh, you know, six mm-hmm. big ones and we have, um, commissions we have 50 in the united states plus all the tribal commissions and the problem with it is there's no single entry point for fighters and officials so mm-hmm. literally you could be working in home depot today and a week from now you could be judging a, a fight and right. if you really and if you really your father's connected you could be rough in a fight god forbid but that's a part of the problem you know the nfl and major league baseball and basketball and stuff you don't, you go through one entry point, you go through MLB or the NL or, you know what I mean? And right. they put you through the rigors and they make sure you've had, you know, 500 amateur uh, games that you've officiated or whatever, and you're graded all along the way. And that just didn't happen. That don't happen across the board. I wish it did more, you know, here. What, what, one thing I wanted to touch on that, uh, uh, Every time I'm, I, I'm watching a fight on television, especially when I'm with friends or, or family who they're not hardcore boxing fans, they're casual fans, just enjoying the fight. And they see, but they know enough to see like, you know, you see the same rotation of, of veteran referees. Um, I've had I've had instances where you haven't, you've, re- you've ref the fight outside of California. Sure. And, and uh, the people I've been watching with, with have asked me like, Hey, I thought he was a California referee. Like, Oh no, they're able to, to go, you know, they, there's a process they can go through. Can you just touch on that on how you're, you as a, as a professional referee are able to work other commissions, not just in the States, but in other countries as well. Okay. So again, there's commissions and then there's sanctioning bodies. So you work in your state usually, but then a lot of guys, they call up and they solicit and they apply to work in neighboring States and, um, and if they're so fortunate enough that that state needs the help, they'll take them. Um, also, sanctioning bodies will assign you to fights. So my primary work is here in California. But uh, I, um, a while back, some of the Vegas officials were getting kind of old. So um, Bob Bennett reached out and asked a few of us if we'd like to be Vegas refs. We went through a little bit of a process because he had known our work. So I'm one of four guys uh, – in the world that also works in Las Vegas only when they have the need. That's why mm-hmm. you guys remember when Canelo fought um, Triple G that third time, it was Benji Estevez from New York who did the fight. Right. Exactly. Yeah. He's one of the four and Canelo's camp or um, Triple G's camp for some reason turned down the refs that they were offering up at the time for whatever reason it is that gets to happen. So then, so that's how I get to work in Vegas and here, but also like, um, I worked in Nebraska and Tennessee and Atlanta recently, so uh, in Alabama. Those commissions, God bless them, they recognize that they're only doing two fights a year. And right. we do, I don't do all of these, but we do 102, 102 to 120 fights a year in California. Mm-hmm. So I'm getting probably 36 to 45 fights a year, cards of fights, where I'm doing multiple fights and all the guys here are. So, you know, for the experience factor, we have a, a greater pool of depth with the, the guys who are reffing and judging. So those states who have a big event, they want it to go successful, they will reach out to my commissioner and ask, hey, we'd like to you know, get your recommendation on a guy. And I, I got fortunate enough to get brought to other states. And as far as around the world, there's fights and they, they want a, a seasoned referee. And um, the, last, the sanctioning body will put up five names and they will choose one of the five names or the promoter and the camps will give them five names and tell them we want these guys. And if they're members, I'll take them. And it's, there's a lot of politics involved, but, <laughs> and uh, that's why, you know, it's another reason why we don't announce fights. Right. Who's ref in the fight because there's so much politics involved. The referees will get bounced after time, but also it'll give anything that'll happen. If, if you knew I was a fight of triple G Canelo, just say, right a month or six weeks out, anything I did at another fight or I was seen or I was asked a question, the perception might be I'm favoring one guy. Right. Just, oh, I'm going to get booted out of the fight. So I don't, I don't want that to happen. And it happened to a referee innocently two years. Did you guys hear the story about Kenny Bayless with McGregor and uh, Mayweather? Uh, you have to refresh her, Mary. Maybe. Yeah, I'm, there was a lot of stuff going on with that event. 
He very innocently guy asked two oh, years. Oh, it, it was a YouTube interview. That's right. Yeah. right. Guy asked him, what do you think? He goes, I don't like that stuff. I don't think it should happen. Mm-hmm. And Dana White got a hold of that tape and said, he will not be in the building that night. Right. So that's he, right. Yeah. yeah. That's why they don't put out the name of the referees and the judges. They don't want the opportunity also for some in, uh, industrious type of promoter to go over and try to mm-hmm. bribe the guy or do something like that, God forbid, or even right. the perception of it, you know? So you, you mentioned uh, how, how Benji was a referee for Canelo Triple G3, um, or was it two? What, I forgot. It was the last one. It, it was, was the last one. Two. It was the last one. It was two, yeah, two. Um, since you're a part of that small group, were you, I mean, I don't know if you can divulge it, but were you approached or was your name kind of thrown oh, in the name for that My name was in there, absolutely. It was? I know for, yeah, I was told my name was in there and I was sitting there like this going, <laughs> yeah, I didn't get the call, so it is what it is. Is there any other fights, like hype, like you know, high profile fights like that that you almost had had the gig, but they went with the, with another veteran referee? Uh yeah, and there was there was one that I actually got the fight, was assigned the fight, was getting ready to make my uh, travel reservations and all that stuff, and someone in one of the camps uh had me taken off and that was frock and groves in wembley wow wow and and you know sometimes to be very frank with you it it has nothing to do with the ref or the judge right one of the corner man or the promoter want to get an edge and create uh an edge and they'll say well i don't want that guy he's the first guy and if you do anything else we're we're gonna protest this so they take the guy off and he's just collateral damage he didn't do it Uh. it happens Jack, how do you prepare for the for the big fights? I watched your previous interview where you said that you actually watch video and look for fighters' tendencies. Yep. Um, well, I prepare myself the same way all the time. Um, but with the bigger fights, I get an opportunity to either have roughed the guy before or both guys before. But if not, it's usually if it's a big fight, there's plenty of uh, fights of the guy on YouTube. So I will always watch, you know, first of all, I go to box rec to see – if I haven't ref him, is it a righty or a lefty? What's the guy's normal weight? What's he done in his last fights? Has he ever won at this weight? Say he's coming up from welterweight to super welterweight or, or junior middleweight. And I want to w- watch how he's done in those weight classes to, to see if how he's going to handle the weight gain and stuff like that. Because sometimes you don't bring your power. Or if a guy's coming down, sometimes you don't. You come in and you're, you're drained, you're empty. Um, so, and I'm looking for tendencies. I'm looking for that kind of information, but I'm also looking, is he a righty against the lefty? If, man, it's a different fight with a righty against the lefty. It's much more difficult for a referee. You got to change your positioning because, you, you know, usually we look from the top of the head through the shoulders, maybe through the chest, like a, like a square in there. Mm-hmm. But when you got a righty against the lefty, because the nature of the way they're going to step and punch you got to stay back enough to see their feet because their heads are going to collide, their elbows, their shoulders, their feet are going to get entangled, and you don't want to ever call a knockdown, a slip, or vice versa because you missed what happened with the feet. So there's that preparation. Then um, I'm looking at fights to see tendencies. So I'm going to give you a great example. I did a lot of research on Tyson Fury before I did their first fight. So when I went into the dressing room, a couple of the things that I told each fighter, like I told uh, Deontay Wilder, Okay, so uh, one of the things you got to watch out for me tonight is you got to not throw those big looping punches because if if he doesn't turn his head and you hit him behind the head, I'm not going to call it a knockdown and I'm not going to call it a legal punch. So you got to straighten up that punch and don't, you know, hit with the, I'm trying to get in the camera, don't yeah. hit with the palm of the hand like he has a tendency of doing and when he's doing the bomb squad. Second thing is what, what I told Wilder is um, he likes to use his left hand as, a, as like a spear and hold, hold his opponent's head, leave his arm straight out without punching and put his hand in the fighter's face so the fighter can't see when he's going to drop the, the right hand. It's illegal. You, gotta, you can't leave your hand out there, especially if you touch the guy's face. It's like holding and hitting or spearing. So I warned him in the dressing room, and he did it zero times in the ring. Well, Tyson Fury, I went in and I said, Tyson, there will be none of, you know, the nice way. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> you, but I said, yeah. be none of that. I don't know if you've ever watched Tyson. He'll hold the rope with his right hand, dive out and throw a jab with his left and use the ropes to spring him back out of range so the guy can't counter. You're not allowed to do that. Second thing I told Tyson is um, no backhands. He has a tendency, instead of throwing the – where's that screen there? 
instead of throwing the draft straight to throw it as a backhand and hit with the back part of the glove. And right. that's legal. And he didn't do any of it in the ring. I told him each a few more things, but that's the, for instance, of the, of the preparation of the act, that actual fight. And then my personal preparation is before the fight, I'm watching videos of the guys. I'm watching videos of fights of myself. Uh, and I have a book that I uh, started uh, 20 years ago. I'm trying to get in the frame. 20 years ago, and this book has rules, regulations, and scenarios that I have in it. I don't know mm. if I can get it in there. Rules, regulations, and scenarios oh, wow. that I go through, and that's 22 years of, of rule, scenarios. Each one of those paragraphs is a scenario that I walk through in my head. The reason why is in baseball, in football, in hockey, what happens before the game starts? The umpire gets to go behind the plate and watch 50 to 100 pitches. The refs mm -hmm. on the rink and the NHL, they get to skate around the rink and, and get warmed up. Football, they're, they're doing the practice plays. They're in their position. They're moving, right? Me, we get in the ring, the bell rings. They could be knockdowns and, and all kinds of stuff from yeah. the second. So this is my personal way of getting in the zone. So when I get in that ring, I've been thinking boxing, watching boxing, and moving around. Um, if I haven't refed in over two weeks, I go to Robert Garcia's gym. And uh, the old gym, and I'll walk around, I'll move around with the guys while they're sparring. And by the time I step in that ring, I am fully focused on what I'm about to do, and I won't get caught short and, and cold, as they say, and stuff like that. And then the last two days, I treat myself like a fighter. There's no alcohol. I get plenty of rest. I eat a really, people think I'm nuts. I eat a <laughs> huge meal the day of the fight, right? As close as I can to fight time, I eat a huge meal because... For me personally, if I get there, I get there three or four hours before the fight. Mm -hmm. By the time I'm in that ring, I don't want to be empty. So I eat a big meal. So that's not, you know, that gut isn't making noises and it's worked for me so far. <laughs> you mentioned the Tyson Fury Wilder fight. Can you just clear up all the drama that they had with Tyson Fury's gloves supposedly not fitting and he had his fist further down and he was punching with that part of the hand? Yeah, um, well... Let me just tell you about the gloves. So I wrote a couple of notes. Um, let me explain the process because this is great education for the people that are casual fight fans as well. So a day before the fight, or actually let me back up and say this, a fighter can choose his own gloves. Like if he's sponsored by Everlast or Reyes or, or Grant, they will provide him with gloves of his choice based upon what he likes and, and stuff like that. And they will, they give those gloves to the promoter and then the promoter, gets them to the arena and gives them to the um, commission. If not, the promoter will provide gloves based upon what was written in the contract. They might have both asked for Reyes MX-50s. They might have both asked to not use those gloves, whatever. So the day before the fight, there's the official weigh-in. Right after the weigh-in takes place is the glove selection and the rules meeting. And what happens is the fighters go into a separate room. You get rid of the press, and the fighters go into a separate room, and the gloves that were chosen or provided is two or three of each pair, and the fighters witnessed by the other camp in that room tries those gloves on and chooses a right and a left glove, and then our inspectors take those gloves right on it, uh, number one, on the one, one right and one left, number one. Mm -hmm. and on the backups, number two. And both camps sign the gloves. Mm -hmm. Those gloves then stay with the, the inspector that was chosen. He takes them home with him. Before he goes home, he goes to, like, a facility, maybe a post office, and right. actually weighs them on a scale that they weigh letters to make sure that 10-ounce glove is 10 ounces. Mm -hmm. Because if it's under too much or over too much we're throwing those gloves out and we aren't using them and every now and then you'll find a defective glove and we got to redo it last minute no big deal it happens that inspector has those gloves and about two hours prior to fight time the inspector will deliver the gloves to the corner and there is another inspector in that room who is assigned to that fighter from the moment he walks in to the building he's assigned to that fighter stays with him to make sure there's no illegal substances taken usually does the random drug testing where he urinates uh, you know into a, a drug test kit and he stays with them the whole time we're watching and so is the other corner comes in and watches the hand wraps both mm -hmm. uh, the the inspector signs off on the hand wraps 
and puts enough stuff through it where if they tried to take off the tape to do something, you can never line up the lines again. So that doesn't get done. And then he puts the gloves on and the inspector tapes it. So I don't know where these guys are getting this theory that he was punching the wall 50 times or he didn't have his hand in the glove. It's, it's stupid. And it's, they're reaching for something that's really not there. They, they are really uh, uneducated or they're just reaching for some reason. Well, is it, isn't it more like because obviously the more attention a fight gets, the more high profile it gets, obviously the more eyeballs and the more opinions you're going to see. So, I mean, that was a, obviously I had a, I had a lot of attention, especially in terms of actual boxing fans. So, I mean, you being in the game, don't you agree that the more attention a fight has, the more scrutiny you're going to get? 110% correct. And additionally, you know, people ask me this question all the time. What's different being a referee now than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago? When I grew up, like, and I wanted to know the results of a fight that happened on a Friday night in Madison Square Garden, if I didn't listen to it on the radio or see it on television, the only way I knew about the fight was I picked up they, that day's social media, which was the newspaper, <laughs> and if they didn't have a little blurb in it that said, you know, fighter so-and-so won, I didn't know who won. Today, before I step out of the ring, the freaking fight's on YouTube. It's, in, it's <laughs> everywhere. It's all over the world. So yeah. the scrutiny is uh, is literally, I'm not even exaggerating at all, a hundred times what it was 30 years ago. And the bad part about it is social media. Everyone's got a phone. Everyone's making a tape. And a lot of guys, you know, they feel, it's and, it's, and truthfully so, I agree with it, they feel so excited about being in the arena. They're taping and they're posting. You know, right. they had great seats at their fight and stuff like that. But, you know, there are haters out there. It doesn't matter what you do. You could... You know, whatever. There's people that hate fighters. There's people that hate refs. There's people that hate whatever. They're always going to put something up controversial to bring attention to themselves to maybe have a voice. You guys know them, keyboard warriors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Jack, uh, you heard a lot of praise for your handling of the Deontay Wilder Tyson Fury fight, the first fight, where despite a huge knockdown by Tyson, you actually you know did the whole ten count, let him get up, gave him some time. Can you just tell us? You know, kind of what went through your mind during that period? Uh, that's a great question. I've answered this, you know, many times, stuff like that. So, f first of all, this was a heavyweight championship fight that was extremely close, was very spirited, and they were in the last round of the fight, okay? Yeah. And there hadn't been a lot of huge damage prior to that point. There weren't, other than the ninth round knockdown, was more of, which was more of a balance issue, uh, Fury got knocked off balance. He didn't get dropped where he lost muscle control. It was just a, an off balance thing. Um, more like a flash knockdown, but not exactly. So I had, I had a guy that you know was in the 12th round without a lot of damage prior. He went down with a thunderous combination. I give you that. But I've also always been taught to count a champion out. So here's the 12th round of a heavyweight, you know, title bout with lots of eyes on it. I don't want to rush the judgment. And then this is where I'm going to tell you my EMT and experience came in. So my job is to very quickly get the standing fighter away, going to a neutral corner and pick up the count. I watched Fury go down, immediately pointed for, for a while to go to the neutral corner, spun my head and picked up the count of one from the timekeeper. Turn back two, three in my head as I was moving towards them. And let me say this too. I was six feet away from those guys in my position when Fury got hit. And Fury fell away from me, which gave me at least 12 feet from his face. I couldn't see his face. Just a second. Because his chest. I couldn't. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. His okay. Barrel, he's barrel chested and his head was below his chest. So I really couldn't see his face or his eyes. But what I did notice, as soon as I turned around to start walking to him, his right leg was up in the air. His, his right leg was resting on his right foot. If you're unconscious, that thing is flopped over and you're out. The way he was holding it up, he had to be holding it. That wasn't an unconscious person. So I said, let me see what I got. As I took the two steps in, I could see his eyes were actually open. They weren't open all the way. He was like, you know, squinting and grunting, but his eyes were open. And as I got close to him on three and bent down, he tracked me with his eyes. So I knew he was awake, uh, you know, at that point. So I started with four and at five, his eyes popped wide open and, uh, you know, gave a little bit of a, a grunt and a shake of his head or something. And he rolled over and started getting up. And I want to explain this to everybody. 
I want to be able to say this. I'm glad you guys are giving me the opportunity. <laughs> People who think my count was long are either haters, uninformed, or just full of shit. And I love the fact that you're giving me an opportunity to express this. A knockdown is any time due to a legal punch or punches that any part of a fighter's body other than the soles of his feet touch the ground, touch the canvas. Also, due to legal punch or punches, the only thing holding up a fighter is the ropes. It's a knockdown, okay? In this case, he got knocked down legally, okay? When I was counting, as I said, as I said the word nine, his right hand came off the mat, and he was rising. There's no more count. I can't say 10 as he's rising. He's up. My job goes from counting, once I reach eight, to mandatory eight count. So once I reach eight, if no part of his body other than the soles of his feet are on the ground, it changes from a count to an assessment. And that's what I did. I went to see if he was able to intelligently defend himself from that point. And, you know, you guys, I don't know if you, you've seen a lot of this lately, but there are some referees that will ask the, the, the fighter who is knocked down questions mm -hmm. and then make the fighter walk straight to him. Others will ask him questions and make him walk to the right or the left. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. This is now being instituted into the ABC referees manual, making the fighter walk to the right or left. And here's why. In the old days when Jack Dempsey fought and mm -hmm. Jack Johnson, when those guys got knocked down, Dempsey or Johnson would stand behind the fighter, behind his butt. So this guy's messed up and he's leaning on his hands and they stood behind him. And as soon as their hands came off the mat, they were allowed to hit him from behind. So this was so brutal and guys were getting hurt. They instituted rules of you're not allowed to hit a fighter as he's rising from a knockdown. But that got later taken out of effect when they said once a fighter is down, because they knew it was still brutal, he just gets up to his feet and, you, you know, the referee can't tell if he's ready to go or not. So they said, okay, from now on, you know, maybe in the 50s, I don't even know when they changed it. From now on, on a knockdown, there's going to be the, the standing fighter has to go to a neutral corner and stay in that corner until the referee says box. And the rising fighter gets a mandatory eight count. To, so the referee can assess his condition. Are we on the same page? Right. So 25 years ago, they started, they realized getting him up, wiping his gloves, and saying go isn't enough because instinctually some of these guys can get on their feet. So they started checking their um, ability to control their own body, you know, if they know where they are and stuff. And they know they could have to defend themselves. So they started asking them questions. Are you okay? Can you continue? And then they went even further. Well, maybe, let's see if he can carry his weight. They made him walk to him. Well, in the later day, in this, this modern day now, for the last five years, the ringside physicians, who some of them are neurosurgeons, told us any drunk can stagger forward. Mm -hmm. You got to make him walk to the right or left. And, and let me back up and say this and give you the perfect analogy to the haters. Yeah. Stop. He's driving down the street. He's doing his you know, patrol, and he sees a car going 70 miles an hour, weaving in and out of traffic in front of a school at 3 in the afternoon. He pulls the guy over. He tells him, roll down the window. Guy rolls down the window. Cop smells alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. He says to the guy, sir, have you been drinking? And the guy says, no, officer. Is the cop going to go, okay, thank you, and drive away? <laughs> right. Get him out, and he's going to give him a sobriety test. Mm -hmm. Well, we... Now give the referee sobriety test. Why? Because I just had a guy right in front of me. I saw the mechanism of injury. I saw this guy get hit where his head snapped and his brain rattled against his cage. And I saw his, his body language where he lost control of his body and fell straight down, whacked his head on the canvas. And now he's rising. I can't just sit, let him go. I got to give him a referee sobriety test. I got to make him demonstrate he knows who he is, where he is, why he's there. How do you do? How do you do that? You okay? Yes. Do you want to continue? Yes. Put your hands up. Walk to the right. Walk to the left to demonstrate to the fans, the commission, the doctors, and everyone watching. He's in full control of his body, and that's exactly what Tyson Fury did. And just re recently, I'm I'm fortunate to be involved 
with the ABC and I'm on the uh, rules committee for the ABC and um, we just they just accepted our proposal of instituting it that now on, not on every knockdown, a flash knockdown, you don't need to use it. Early in the fight, guy gets knocked down, a flash knockdown, he's up by three, telling you get out of the way, you don't have to make him walk and waste time. But if you have a, a damaged fighter that in the history of that fight has been down before or he's been taken a beating, he has visible physical damage, you're even wondering if he's if he has a mathematical chance to win on the scorecards. You know he's been taken the beating and he gets dropped dramatically hard you give him that referee sobriety test. Jack, with a, an interview you did with BT Sport afterwards, you said that you count the Fury as the best decision of your career so far. I was just wondering, what's your top three? Ah, okay. Top three. Number one is Tyson Fury because um, the, the scrutiny and the magnitude of the fight, um, I was comfortable with what I did uh, under that grade of pressure, okay? And I'm very happy with the decision. Second one would have to be... Um, Oh, uh, do you guys remember when Andre Ward fought uh, La Bamba, Edwin Rodriguez? Mm-hmm. Was that in, was that up down here? It was up by you, man. It was in Citizens Bank Arena. It was, right right down the street right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I got to tell you guys, I walked into that arena, and you could cut the tension with a knife. Those guys hated each other so bad. I swear to God, the whole place was tense. I got I was immediately walking in with my uniform on my, you know, on my shoulders. I got approached by the first promoter, then the cornerman of the second fighter, and in the dressing room, I couldn't even get my instructions out because I was getting interrupted by corner people and the fighters. You better watch. He does this. You better watch. He does that. And it was like I was doing everything I could just to calm them down in the dressing room. And, man, I knew it was it was going to be ugly. And if you guys rem- don't remember, I'm going to remind you. So La Bamba was really mouthing off to Andre Ward, trying to get under his skin, and he did. And uh, Edwin, I think, in my opinion, purposefully missed weight. He wanted to come in a little heavy to mm-hmm. get a little advantage, and he did. And um, you guys might not know this, but he had they had a way in at a certain time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, La, La Bamba didn't make weight, so they had they had a rule that going to give him a chance to make the weight. He forfeited. He had a, he was making a million. He forfeited two hundred thousand dollars for not making weight, and a hundred went to Andre Ward, and I think a hundred went to the state. I don't remember the right. exact amounts. So then the next morning they're supposed to weigh him in at nine o'clock. So right. there was some guys in Andre Ward's corner, which I don't think he had after that fight anymore. That actually went down and stole the digital scale and the wire <laughs> so the guy couldn't weigh in to make them stay that weight and drain them as much as they could, as close as they can get to the fight. Is that right. insane? This is professional wow. sport. And, wow. and that's just a, a picture of what was going on in there. And I kept them apart during pre-fight instructions, held their gloves, touched their gloves, and pushed them out of the way. And the first four rounds were just nasty ugly grit playground shoulders elbows wrestling headbutt and this was a, the main event on hbo with lampley kellerman and jones that you know it was a big deal so right. i didn't want to take points i didn't want to disqualify so i was trying to use my people skills to calm them down and i was giving them warnings and going into the corner between rounds and imploring them come on guys you gotta knock that off stop this and stop that and every time i went in the one of the guy's corner but he's doing this he's like a little kid, like two brothers fighting, and you go into you tell <laughs> one kid, "What so and so's doing?" That? It was the same exact thing. They just it was it was pandemonium. So in the fourth round, they got tied up early in the fourth round, where Andre was bobbing and weaving, and Andre's head ended up in Labamba's chest, and Labamba wrapped his right arm around Andre's like a rear naked. Yeah, or a guillotine, a gu- no, not a rear naked, a guillotine. Mm-hmm. And actually lifted and was choking Andre, and I was yelling stop as I was coming in to break him, and the bomber wasn't stopping, and Andre started throwing punches over the top. So I literally physically jumped in to split him up, and I grabbed Andre to spin him off. I got hit in the face by uh, by Rodriguez. <laughs> I shoved them both. To make a long story short, I took two points from each guy and had, and I asked the commission, and they did to find each fighter. Oh, wow. And, and they, they did. And I basically, I took my time because this was spiraling out of control and I wanted to break the momentum. 
So I took my time. I walked across the ring, came back, warned both guys, took my time, let about a minute and a half to two minutes go by. And I brought him to Sam, Sam and I said, the next guy is getting disqualified. Nobody's getting paid. Somebody gets disqualified. And they calmed down. We had a pretty good fight for the next, <laughs> 10 rounds, for the next eight rounds. When you that talk was, money, when you talk when you talk money and says nobody's getting paid, then they get serious, right? I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, fights. You know, the third, I like, guess, the three best. The the next one I'd say was there's a lot of fights that we stop. I, I think one of the one of the uh, best things I did, you know, because it was the right thing to do, was when you stop a fight and people are booing you because they don't understand what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. Like I, I did Wilder and Duhapis, and Duhapis's chin. That was New York, uh, right? Sorry? Mm-hmm. That was in New York? Nope. Uh, it was in um, Alabama. Oh, Alabama. That's right. That's right. And uh, Duhapis's chin and grit and heart was too much for his ability. Wilder was pummeling this guy, and this guy would not go down. And his face was banged up. And we reached a point in the fight that the, Duhapis couldn't win mathematically. He had a puncher's chance, but he really hadn't been landing it. And then he was he was fighting basically defensive the most of the time, just looking to get that one good shot in. And he had visible physical damage. And I said to myself, what's the point? Mm-hmm. And I stopped it in like the 10th after a really bad volley that snapped his head. And you know what? You don't know who you save. You just, you know what I mean? You, you know right. who you lose. God forbid that happens. But you don't know the fighters you save and you got to pull them out of there. So Jack, uh, Mike, I think uh, Mike will probably jump on this question, but because um, we before we you had came on, we were talking about uh, the Chavez Meldrick Taylor mm-hmm. uh, fight from back in the day. I think Mike knows uh, a little bit more details about the question, so go ahead, take it away, Mike. Uh, Jack, you did a, a fight this year. It was Brian Perella oh, against Perella. Abel Ramos, which is very, very reminiscent of uh, Chavez and Taylor. Perella was ahead on the cards going into the last round. It was a 10-round fight. There was a handful of seconds left. Abel Ramos knocks him down, and then you waved it off. And obviously, his corner were kind of pissed because obviously there was only, I don't know, two, three seconds left, and he was you know quite ahead on the scorecards. So I was just wondering, as the referee, do you think about that? Do you think you know there's only a couple of seconds left? He could probably walk across the other side of the ring, and the fight would have been called off for... Sure. Sure, think about it. Well, let me ask you guys a question. Mm-hmm. Why do you guys think I stopped the fight? For your safety. How about you, Danny? Yeah, I agree. Because we, like I mentioned, we had talked right before you came on, and we were talking about that. Like, well, I mean, say, I mean, only you. You're looking a fighter in the in the eye. So you know, as as, as you know, you mentioned your training and all that stuff. So, I mean, that that, that would be our guess. So uh, I want your opinion, and I want you guys to feel free to call bullshit on whatever I'm saying right now. You mm-hmm. cannot hurt my feelings. If you don't agree, <laughs> I'd love to hear what you got to say. But when I tell you this, you, you, you might go, wow, I never thought about that. I didn't stop that fight for safety. I did not stop it for safety. Prior to the last knockdown, there was two knockdowns right at the end. Prior to the second knockdown, the timekeeper time keeper gave the 10-second warning and I acknowledged the 10-second warning by pointing to the timekeeper. So I knew he was not going to take another punch because he went down maybe three seconds after that 10-second warning. And I had to go through my, you know, check. So the clock would have been clock would have been out by the time I said box. I did not stop it for safety. The reason oh. I stopped it is this, okay? Perella was winning the fight, but he wasn't winning. He might have been ahead on all the scorecards every single round. But there were, were a lot of close rounds in there. This guy Ramos wasn't out of that fight, and Ramos did was doing what he needed to do, knowing he was behind, and he put the pressure on. Additionally, throughout that whole fight, Perella got pretty banged up. It was no easy fight. His face was marred because they did a lot of back and forths. Even though Perella might have won the round, he took some, some good shots. So the 12th round comes. We got about 20 to 30 seconds left, and Perella gets hit with a sh- an uppercut, that I, I'm, I'm, I give him all the credit in the world that he got up because it, there's, there's diff, different types of punches do di- have different effects. Hooks and uppercuts are way worse than um, straight punches. And I can get into the physiology of why that happens, what happens to the brain when the head's going back and forth compared to what happens to the brain when there's a snapping motion, what happens inside the skull. 
The hooks and uppercuts are way more dangerous. And that was demonstrated by Perella's body language. He didn't fall backwards. He melted straight down to the ground. He lost all of his muscle control. Two things went through my head. 12th round, I got to give the guy, or 10th round, last round, I got to give the guy a shot on a really devastating knockdown. And I, I get, you know, I started counting because he deserved that opportunity. What surprised me was he got up so quick. A seasoned veteran hit with a shot like that will stay on his knee, take some nice deep breaths, take the count eight or nine and pop up at the end. So he's, he's got his head together, his composure. Perella popped right up. So the first thoughts through my head was, this guy either received terrible training or he's really buzzed and it's instinctual. He's just popping up. Okay. So then after a knockdown like that, I'm looking for how the fighter responds. A fighter can run, hold, fight back, bob and weave, take a knee, spit out his mouthpiece, hit the other guy in the groin, get a point taken away and get another 10 to 15 seconds worth of rest. They can do a lot of things. The least thing that I want to see them do is just stand there and fight back. The first thing I want to see them do is run. Because that means they got their composure, they got their legs. <laughs> if they can't run, hold, just stall, hold. And if I'm saying let go, don't even let go. Hold <laughs> and make me break you. I'm not going to take points unless it's egregious. I get what they're doing. I'm happy that they're thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. And if they spit out their mouthpiece, they're going to get the point taken away. They're going to get that extra rest. rest. But they lost the point, which makes it very hard for them. You know, one or two points in a fight, it really changes, especially on a close fight, can change anything. But it's, they're thinking, I'm happy. So put this, so after the knockdown, Perella got up, and all he, he didn't have his legs, obviously. After the first knockdown, he kind of just melted back into the ropes, had the, had the earmuffs on, tried throwing some punches that had nothing on him, and then took one step and got hit with a punch that he had no balance and knocked him flying, you, you guys please watch it again, into the ropes. And then he got up again. Again, he didn't take it on the knee. He popped right up. And the next thing he did was he put his hands on the ropes, which tells me he's dizzy. Fighters don't put their hands on the rope unless they're looking you know, to get their bearing. I made him get his hands off the ropes. And this time I said, you okay? He said, yes. I take, take three steps and turn and come back to me. And as he was on his third step, he stumbled. He, he couldn't keep his balance, and he couldn't stop, and he kept going into his corner. So at that point, I had a choice. And what I said to myself is, if, if there was more time in this fight, I would have never let that guy continue because he's wasted. So how can I stall and go, hey, I know there's no more time on the clock, so let me just stall, say box, know when the round's over, and let it go to scorecards. Abel Ramos put him in that condition. Abel Ramos deserved the TKO. He did his job. So I, and let me tell you something. The three things in boxing. First thing a fighter wants to do is knock the shit out of his opponent. And knock <laughs> out. Second yeah. thing he wants, to, he needs to do, knock the crap out of his opponent till the guy quits, the corner throws in a towel, or he forces the referee to stop the fight. And when you can't do the first two, you try to outpoint him. You try to win more rounds. Perella, I mean, uh, Ramos did number two. It, it didn't matter how much time was left. He rendered that guy unable to continue. And controversial or not, I respect everybody's opinion, but you ain't, not you, but <laughs> those guys aren't the guys in there tasked with the authority and the responsibility to do what's fair. And that's what I did. And until some major sanctioning body or my commission sits me down and says, what you did is wrong, I'm going to keep doing it this way on fairness. So now hit me with your best shot on that, guys. Has it? Has anybody ever told you? Like, for example, Andy Foster is obviously your boss for the commission. He's the head honcho of the California Commission. Uh, we've had him on our show, by the way. He was on a couple months ago. Um, and has there ever been a time we've ever had here? He's the best. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we we've been hearing about that. Yeah, he's 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 very knowledgeable. He's, he was a fighter. So. You could YouTube videos of him boxing and doing MMA. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's an crazy. Everything. Promotion, so, judging, reference. So the the reason I, I brought him up because you you kind of made me think about it. You mentioned like you know if so if it's like your boss or somebody high ranking in the commission sits you down and says, hey, you know what, this was wrong. Has that ever happened in your career? Of course. 
Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. I mean, well, I, I mean, like, what, can you give an example of what one yeah. decision? Okay, here's a great. Here's, I got two of them for you. Okay, mm. um, Austin Trout was fighting a guy named Joey Hernandez. Mm-hmm. Austin Trout was shellacking Joey Hernandez. <laughs> It was like a tune-up fight in between. Joey's a good kid and hard. His father I know real well, but he was losing, and he was losing badly. And um, it got to a point where Hernandez, I mean, um, yeah, Joey Hernandez, grabbed Austin Trout, picked him up, and threw him down on the ground. And Austin rolled over, got up, and I checked him. He was fine. So I called time. I gave him a really hard warning, and I took one point Mm -hmm. from Hernandez for doing what he did. So we got in the dressing room and Andy in front of everybody in that dressing room, he solicited their input, gave, said, I thought that was uh, terrible. I thought that was the wrong thing. What you did, that was an egregious foul. You should have taken two points. And I said, I respect your opinion, but you should really ask me first why I didn't, you know, (laughs) and this was my viewpoint on it. Hernandez was losing. He got frustrated and he picked up, Trout and he didn't throw him over his shoulder. He picked him up over his head and then he held him and about just below his shoulders he let him go. So Trout fell about two feet. But Trout's athletic. He rolled up and he was not. He did not get hurt at all. Mm-hmm. So how much damage was done? Zero. The right. guy was frustrated and he did something out of frustration. He was losing every round of the fight. My personal opinion was. Do I want to take two points away from this guy and make him more frustrated and put him into a corner where he says, I can't win this fight. Then he's going to really go out and do something like bite his ear or break <laughs> Trout's arm or something like that. And we'll have a riot on our hands. Most of the time when a guy does something like that, he's in desperation and he's probably going to get knocked out pretty soon after that. And that's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. Trout came out and finished him mm-hmm. more so that he, he barraged him, and and uh, Joey went down for a knockdown and decided to stay there as I was counting to 10. Mm-hmm. So now that doesn't mean I'm right, but and my boss is my boss. Yeah. To me, I learned, okay, he wants on egregious-looking fouls for the optics, he wants me to take more than one point. And then the same thing happened on a fight I did where – you guys, this, this is educational too. And it was uh, Mexico against the Philippines in the, in the stub hub. I don't know what year it was, but the Philippine fighter was uh, beating the uh, Mexican fighter pretty good. And they were in the center of the ring, and they, he hit him with a, uh, the Philippine guy hit him with a pretty good volley mm-hmm. and finished with a left hook to the, to the um, liver. Mm-hmm. And the Mexican guy covered up and started going backwards. The Philippines stopped thinking he was going down, and then the Mexican guy didn't take a knee. So the Philip and, and I was walking in to get to him. So the Philippine realized he didn't go down. Let me go finish this guy right. and go charging in to finish. And as the F- Mexican guy sees the Philippine coming, he goes, shit, I don't want no more of this. <laughs> and suddenly so takes a knee. Well, the Philippine already had it in his head and was winding up. So just as the Philippines knee hit the ground. I'm sorry, the Mexican guy's hit, knee hit the ground. Mm-hmm. The Philippines punch went off, and he hit him while the guy was down. But the punch grazed the Mexican guy's head. Mm-hmm. So I took one point in that situation because what Andy at the time didn't understand, or, you know, the optics look bad, but he doesn't understand. Intentional fouls with injury, mandatory two points. Intentional fouls without injury, it's up to the discretion of the referee. Mm-hmm. And you have to look it up in the ABC. So the only time you're ever going to see it, you should ever see it, a guy take two points is on an intentional foul with injury. So in this case, let me tell you how I judged it. I say to myself, when a guy goes down like that and then he gets hit while he's down, what put him down? What's keeping him down? Was the punch that put him down the one that's keeping him there? Well, look. If that second punch to the head would have been bad enough, that fighter that was on his knee would have flopped over and fell to the canvas because he would have got because he took a headshot. That guy was sitting there on his knee, wincing in the pain from the liver shot. He never moved off his knee. So the second shot had very little effect. I took one point. And that's what 
That's what people don't understand. Like this, <laughs> that's how fast it happens. And you got to look, you got to understand what you're looking at and make and render those decisions based on, on safety and fairness. So Andy wasn't happy about that. He wanted me to take two points. So let's fast forward. You ready? Ready. Yeah. KSI is fighting Logan Paul. Mm-hmm. Okay. KSI, uh, Logan Paul grabs, hits, hits KSI with a beautiful uppercut, a clean shot. Then he grabs KSI behind the head and holds his head and hits him with a second uppercut. Right. He's on the way down, and, and Logan hits him with two more shots. Did they do damage? No, but it was it was a group. The first one was egregious enough, and the two more, I had to make a statement because it was egregious. And here's here's the thing: people don't understand. If I would have taken one point, it would have been nine nine, right? Mm-hmm. Right. All I wanted to do is even out the round to wipe that out without penalizing somebody too bad where they couldn't win. So in this case, because I wanted to make a statement, you guys you could watch the fight again. I initially went down. And then I waved the, the knockdown off because when I realized the holding behind the head punch was what put him down. So I went down and then I waved it off. But when I called time, it gave me a chance to think and contemplate what would be the best thing for me to do to bo- for boxing in this case. And I said, I'll tell you what, if I take two points and I scored a knockdown, mm-hmm. you get two points for the knockdown, two points taken away. He said, in 9 9, we got 8 8. What's the difference? Right. Well, everybody's hammering me about, oh, you took two points. <laughs> he did the same thing. He's taking one point. But it's people that don't understand. So Andy was happy because I made a statement that he wants the California Athletic Commission of referees to make that those type of things won't be accepted here. And I didn't affect the fight any different than 1-1. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? 9-9. Nine, right. nine. Jack, is there a process that happens if you consistently make you know bad decisions, or a judge is handing in consistently bad cards? Um, can you ask the question again? I'm not really sure what you're saying. Like, is there a process of like discipline? Like, if you consistently oh, yeah. make mistakes, or is if yes. a judge is consistently handing in bad cards, like, do they miss a few weeks? Are they relegated to four and six rounders? Absolutely. So after Andy and Mark Relier, who's the best chief inspector we've ever had too, a retired LA County Sheriff, who I told you I sat in a dressing room with, wrapped up ready to fight. So those guys scrutinize every card and, and they hammer, I swear to God, hammer those judges round per round. So you could have been, you could have ref, uh, I'm sorry, judged 40 rounds of boxing that night and you were off on one round that he felt was wrong, they're giving you a homework assignment of going back and watching that fight and justifying or explaining yourself better on why you did it in that round. And if you were off from everybody else and it was a high-profile fight, you can bet your ass you're going to be sitting on the sidelines and doing some undercard fights for a couple of months before you get back in the ring. And because if you can't justify what you did, you know, uh, he doesn't want to put you in on the high-profile fights. It just... Fighters deserve the best. The promoters are paying to have the best in there. And whether you're right or wrong, sometimes they have to do it for optics. Same thing with the referees. If the referees make an egregious mistake and, and, you know, God, get somebody hurt on something that was obvious, not stop a fight or what happens a lot, stop fights too quick. They don't understand what they're looking at and they stop fights too quick. Those guys, you know, as they're climbing the ladder, Mm -hmm. As they're climbing the ladder, they take a few steps back and they go a little bit lower back on the ladder. <laughs> they got to make those steps back up again. And, uh, you know, it's happened to all of us. It's happened to all of us. Jack, what's your opinion on open scarring, like they recently brought into some MMA? I got mixed emotions about it, but the biggest challenge I see with it is that it tends to pressure the judges to change their scores. Mm-hmm. Not good. So a good example is, say you had it, say Danny had it 98, 94 for the fighter in the red. I had it 98, 94 for the fighter in the red. And you had it 98, 94 for the fighter in the blue. I guarantee the next four rounds, you are freaking out, Michael. You're going, mm-hmm. what am I seeing different? And anything close, you're going to give that red fighter that score because you want to get as close to us as possible and you're not supposed to do that. This is supposed to be three independent people seeing it, three different views, 
so they don't see everything exactly the same and come up with a score based upon the four criteria of score in a fight. So that's my first concern. The the um, other thing is, you know, it might tend, and let me say this, we're the only sport, maybe other than gymnastics and Olympics or something like that, where the scorecards aren't read till the end or nobody really knows who won till the end and the judges judging don't know what the other judges are thinking. Mm-hmm. Only sport that's like that. So the open scoring tends to change that. And, you know, I'm sorry to say it, but you have weak minded officials that don't want to go against say a house fighter or a, uh, a promoter's fighter and they might be swayed by that open scoring, and that's what it tends to lead to. And, and let, let me say this, too. You guys, I, I swear to you, judging a fight up close and personal around the ring, especially being in the hot seat, is totally a different experience than watching it at home. And I'm going to explain why. If people don't understand. You're watching it 3D. You're watching it in live time, 10 feet from the action. You're seeing everything happen in front of you in real life, in real time. When you're watching it on television, you're totally handicapped for a few reasons. One, you're watching it on 2D. You're watching just a picture of this guy moving. But you don't see the impact of the punches. You don't hear the thumping of the punches. That's why sometimes you'll see a fighter who's who's pitter-pattering and pitter-patting and getting a lot of little scoring blows in, and a guy who's done less work and is cracking him with those shots, and the, and the fans, you know, vote two different ways, and they're all screaming about it, and the guys went with the guy who threw the harder punches because they could hear and see the punches. They could see the reaction on the fighter's skin. They could see, they could hear him grunt. They could see him take two, three steps back. Not only that, I'm telling you as a referee, it's the same thing. The cameras change angles so quickly, and sometimes they put it overhead. You don't really see the picture. They're Mm -hmm. doing it for entertainment. You miss sometimes the bottom half of their body because they want to unfocus, and you have to see the whole picture. It's way more difficult watching it at home and really get an accurate feel of what it is than being at the ring. So, you know, that tends to contribute to a lot of controversy too. And then people who don't know really what they're looking at. Yeah. So this will be uh, my my final question on on, on my side, Jack. Uh, kind of throw in the towel on me, bro. I get it. <laughs> well, we've had you more than an hour. Like we know we know. I'm like, kidding, I'm kidding, man. We know you're a busy guy too, and stuff like that. So you know, we we don't want to overstay our welcome, of course. But um, but kind of go more in on on t- of going back and what's going on currently with the whole COVID nineteen. Obviously. Everybody knows there's no current sports happening at the moment, which obviously includes boxing. Um, have you, uh, you know, being a veteran referee, especially with the, the largest commission in, in the United States and, you know, speaking with Andy Foster and everything, um, has there been discussions or anything about possibly bringing fights back, maybe with just no fans? Uh, or, you know, is that something that you think Andy Foster would be open to if it came down to that? All of the all of the uh, possibilities are on the table. We're all missing boxing. It's, people want to get back to work, but obviously, we want to we want to do it safely. Dana White and the UFC just tried to hold an event in California against the commission's recommendations, against everyone's recommendations. He was going to do it on the Tachi Palace Indian Reservation. Right. So those are a sovereign nation; they get to do what they want. And I think cooler heads prevailed because the governors or the executives at Disney who owns UFC called up and said, no, 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 you're not doing that. (laughs) So boxing will be coming back soon, but I don't know if Andy or anybody told you what we are doing in in the interim. So is this, this thing stream yard, is this like a zoom type meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Andy, um, as well as now other commissioners have followed suit. Andy put together three weeks ago, a zoom meeting he asked me and some other guys to get some videotapes of uh, the judges, put a few judging rounds on, and I put a few referees rounds on. And then they've had other guys put referees and judges rounds on. And we watched the fight. We've analyzed the round to see how it should have been scored. Not everybody agreed on everything. And we looked at situations of where things happened. Um, a great example. You guys can watch. Obviously not now. Uh, Kermit Cintron fought Sergio Martinez a few years back. Mm -hmm. Watch round seven. 
Sintron gets hit with a beautiful left hand, which he thinks is a headbutt. And there's a little bit of a uh, chaos that okay. goes on where, as a referee. There are so many things that happen in a very short time period that you would be affected by, and you have to demonstrate good judgment and understanding the rules as a guideline that it's amazing to watch what happened and really contemplate on what had to be done in those few seconds. So we discussed that and we outlined what has to be done and all these things. And um, we've been doing that. We have another one Wednesday and I have another one on Thursday with Nevada. They're doing it now and we're training. We're keeping our brains focused. We're mm-hmm. you know, reviewing stuff and uh, I'm, I'm watching fights and, um, you know, people have been asking me uh, as, as yourselves, you know, what fights should I watch? <laughs> so to me, if, if you want to see action, Mm. Watch Gotti Ward, the trilogy, especially round nine of the first fight. Unbelievable exchange. That's the human spirit. It's what people come to watch boxing for. Neither guy would quit. It was unbelievable. That fight could have been stopped multiple times. It was unbelievable. The same thing for action. If you want to watch action, watch the Hagler Hearns best three rounds in boxing <laughs> when they fought. Um, another two other good fights to watch, to see how you would judge them now, I would watch Hagel Leonard, because there was so much controversy on that fight. And you guys judge it, not you, I mean, whoever judges right, it. Right. Same thing with Wilder Fury 1. Review that fight, know what you know now, and t- you see who won. And then as far as what to do that would be exciting, if it was me, you know, uh, want to see stuff, I would watch as many fights as I could on Wilder Fury Joshua Ruiz and Dylan White right now because these guys are all going to be beating each other yeah start writing down your predictions and learning I think he does this better he does that I think this one he when they they fight this will happen and then when they actually eventually fight you get to see what your predictions were based upon what you watch and I think it'll be interesting everybody Mm -hmm. who's gonna end up on top of the heap when all these guys end up fighting each other so that's my you know that's right Actually, I got one more. I, uh, uh, would would you ever be open to, or, or would Andy Foster be open to, like, you, uh, like the commission putting out like um, commentary, like from yourself, like you're analyzing one of your fights, like let's just say Wilder Fury, just uh, you know one that everybody knows, and you're analyzing, like you're commentating on the fight as it like on a YouTube video or something, you're saying, oh, okay, this is when I noticed that Fury did this or that kind of, kind of like an educational aspect, like maybe to train future referees. I don't know if he would do it to train future referees. Cause we do that uh, all the time. We show not only your own fight scenarios, we show I've got it. Okay. Cause I teach mm-hmm. and this class I have coming up, um, which I, by the way, you guys have invited media and since you both live here, I'm going to give you a cordial invitation you guys can attend the class. There'll be no charge. Perfect. I might not want to drive back to the 909 every night. <laughs> you might want to get a hotel room and stuff right. like that. But space permitting, I got to see how many guys. I only got the room is limited, but space permitting. But certainly, but certainly, if you guys want to come out for a day and stand one of the days, because I got to give the seats to the guys, you know, the referees and stuff like that, mm-hmm. come and join us. So you can see what we're, uh, you get a better understanding. Right. You got to know, uh, before I knew you guys, I had done this before, and I put it out to quite a few guys, Steve, Kim, uh, whoever. You know, I put it out to all right. of them. Unfortunately, they don't show up. Two people showed up, a guy named Ray Markarian and Karen Tate. Mm-hmm. They, they flew up to Vancouver, and they spent three days with us at the last class. And you asked them how it was. It's eye-opening to see the things that we have to consider. So I'm inviting both of you guys if you want to come mm-hmm. down. You're more than welcome to. And uh, I don't think Andy would – mind at all i we could very easily ask him uh, if we could do that but andy's all for uh uh including the media there's nothing right. we're not hiding any we make a mistake look i make mistakes if when i make a mistake <laughs> i want to have the fortitude to say yep i could have done that better i could have done that better i can't well, take it back and i always encourage you guys if they're unhappy you know fighters i've had more than one let me tell you guys i've had more than one conversation <laughs> With a fighter after the fight whose adrenaline's still going, or that corner men who have been uh, slinging superlatives at me, and I <laughs> basically say to them, Look, man, if you feel something was done in error, please, I implore you, 
file a, um, file a protest with the commission. You have five days to do that. They'll bring the fight down. I'll show it on a 60-foot screen. And if, if the commission feels that I've done something wrong, we'll change the decision. I got no horse in the race. If the commission feels I did it wrong, we change it, and I'll learn something from it, and I'll look to do it better. And it's happened before. Uh, and the commission has thrown people out because they go, you're out of your mind. <laughs> so they, they, I lost every round. I stopped a fight, eight round fight. I stopped a fight in the seventh. He's lost every round and he's getting a shellacking and, and he goes, I stopped the fight too soon. You know, they, they throw right. stuff like that out, but there have been absolutely successful fights that have been overturned by the corners because there was a rule violation or that they felt the ref made a egregious mistake. All right, one I can give you was, um, uh, Tim Bradley, Nick Campbell. Mm. That was That's a good over. one. That was overturned. Yeah. yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah. And he loves the media. I'm telling you now. He Andy does, yeah. He does. He was on our show. Yeah. What's that? He was on our show a couple months ago, as I mentioned. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Can't he's... get a better guy. He wants everything above board. He's proud of what he's doing and what we're doing. And he wants to get people out there. In fact, you know, what he did uh, after the um, KSI Logan fight, he came into the locker room and grabbed me and the three judges, Pat Russell, Lou Moret, and uh, Alejandro Routine, said, all three of you guys come with me right now, all four of you guys. And he had us out there with um, uh, Lance Pugmire, used to be with LA Times. Right. And he, he had Lance interview them about their scoring, and he, he interviewed me about uh, why I did what I did. And then he said, you three guys can go, and he grabbed me, and he said, you're coming with me. <laughs> Paul was upset, and we went into the, be the belly of the beast. I went into their locker room, and uh, it wasn't pretty. But I got to tell you something. It's great because if you don't go in there and you don't get to explain yourself and agree and disagree like men and women, you know, mm -hmm. they walk away with a chip in their shoulder and I don't have social media outlets. All the public is going to hear is their side of the story. But if they could at least hear why we did what we did, it usually quells the anger and frustration and guys, because they, because they know you weren't, you know, at least they learned you weren't cheating. This is the way you saw it and stuff like that. So I welcome it. If I make a mistake. I got no problem. I can't tell you how many times I've seen guys in an elevator or a hotel. And I've apologized. They go, look, if you feel I've made a mistake, please protest. I, I won't hold any ill feelings towards you or whatever. Right. So, I mean, John Molina, mm -hmm. Jr. Right. Fought, Antonio DeMarco. Mm -hmm. They weren't happy when I stopped that fight. That's what happens. You're right. But they, let me know. they let me yeah. know. But yeah. you know what? To their credit, and they we've moved on. We're and John's <laughs> no longer a fighter anymore. He, he's retired, and uh, his parent, his father, his parents, his wife, everybody's great. But at the time, they weren't very happy. But right, I, I was put in a situation where I felt I had a duty to act. Right. No, absolutely. John Molina has been on our show too. He's a great guy. So, wow, you know, he's a warrior. Can you imagine yeah. calling that kid? Holy yeah. mackerel. Yeah, he's, he was in some, some great fights, so, you know. Provodnikov and Matisse. Yeah, was, those were wild. Those were wild. They left, they left it in the ring. <laughs> but uh, well, those were good fights to watch, you know, Danny? Those are two other good fights. It is, yeah. Gabby Provodnikov, um, uh, Matisse, uh, Molina, Molina Provodnikov. Those are other great bouts to watch. Wow. What about the last round of Vargas Bradley at the Stub Hub? Um, when, that, when I think, they, I think Pat Russell was, Pat a, was a referee. Yeah. Hey, it's, it's great. Uh, and Pat will gladly speak to you about it. In fact, just so you know, we, that's one of the, the fights we show in our seminar. Mm -hmm. And Pat says, I thought I heard a bell. I made a mistake. When I heard right. a 10 second warning, I thought I heard a bell. It's on right. me. Mm -hmm. And he very shortly after that got out of the game. He said, you know, maybe I'm uh, getting too old and he got out of the game. Right. And took responsibility for it, but the thing that people need to understand it was there was no hanky panky, there was no cheating. He yeah. made a mistake. Right. Human. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jack, uh, you know we we appreciate your time, obviously, and 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 you're more than welcome to to jump on anytime you want. Um, I know you have your uh your seminar coming up. I think you pushed it to Labor Day weekend. You mentioned um so six September September so uh. Go ahead and plug that one more time uh, for our listeners and our, our viewers to to know about that and anything else anything else you want you want to plug. Go ahead. All right. Well, we'll um, we're going to have a referees training class for uh, people who are officials. You know, maybe AB. Uh, I'm sorry, 
uh, USA boxing officials that are looking to be getting to the pros, new officials that are looking to up their game, and even seasoned veterans that want to uh, get a little uh, get a little higher in the in the food channel, yeah, food chain. Um, it's going to be held on September fourth, fifth, and sixth. The name of the class is Soul Arbiter, because that's what we are in the ring, Soul yeah. Arbiter. And you can look us up in the next couple of weeks. You'll see, you'll probably see it um, on Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. And you can find me. My handle on a lot of things is to Jack Reese at G my email is to Jack Reese at gmail.com. And, at, and online it's like at to Jack Reese and Twitter or whatever you do with the to Jack Reese, that's where it is. And um, just look for it and you guys will put it out for me. So they'll, they'll be able to find it and inquire about it. Absolutely. Three hard days, three long days. Absolutely. I'd say, no, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, if, if people, you know, obviously are thinking about, jumping into those courses or, or, you know, obviously hearing your guys' uh, uh, instruction, you know, it's not something you want to miss, especially if you live in the Southern California area, you know, might as well take it, take advantage of an opportunity like that. You know, it's not every day you guys do that, you know? No, and I want to invite you guys to something else that I, you know, I just thought about. So since we both live in California and <laughs> we do fights out and, uh, you know, the 909 all the time, I work everywhere, right. I work everywhere. but you guys are obviously coming to the Staples Center and to also to mm -hmm. up and places Anytime I'm reffing, you guys come, or you come when you're coming, send me an email. I'm going to get a credential for you to come into the dressing room with me when I give pre-fight instructions. If you're at, the, if you're there the day before, mm -hmm. uh, you can accompany me. If I'm doing the championship fight, the main event, mm -hmm. uh, the, the championship fight ref, the main event ref does the rules meeting the day before. If it's me, please join me at the rules meeting, the glove selection, the whole bit. And then come in the dressing room with me um, the next day, so you could hear firsthand what I'm saying to these guys. And and all I do is I try to do what I say and say what I do in the ring. You know what I mean? That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. We 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 definitely appreciate that, Jack. And and you know I'm sure we'll we'll take you up on that. You know we've been to numerous events. You know as media and stuff like that, but we haven't been in, in the it's locker great. room during. You gotta come in with me. It's a great experience. It's a good right. behind the scenes experience that'll give you guys insight to make you better at doing this mm -hmm. yeah you'll you'll see stuff you'll go that you never thought about before you know what i mean going on right. in the locker room and it's just a cool experience sounds good yeah I, that, that works for me i'm sure it works and for mike too the fact yeah. that andy was on your show mm -hmm. and i tell him who it is that we want to bring in he's gonna go of course <laughs> you know oh yeah yeah he was Michael, great with us. yeah let's go <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was great with us yeah andy was awesome awesome but but uh as i mentioned jack you know thanks again for um for for jumping on uh you know luckily we're on the we're on the west coast over here so we don't have the three hour uh time gap that the east coast has so um it's still a little bit early and I mean we're all stuck at home pretty much anyway so um, but you know, like I said, anytime you, you got something you got coming up like the, in September, um, just send us an email. I know you got Mike's, uh, email. You got the, he's emailed you from the show. Please, Danny, you got my email address or Michael, give it to you and send me yours. Mm -hmm. like right. Right. Yeah. 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 Everything that Mike gets, uh, we share with each other anyways. Cause I think he's emailed you from our show handle, but either way I can send that to you. That That's no yeah, problem. Yeah. Make the contact and we'll stay in touch and I'll be great. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, Mike, tell uh, tell our listeners and our viewers where they can find our, our podcast on a weekly basis. At The Last Round 12 on Twitter and Instagram, and you can find us in all the usual places, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Radio Republic, Deezer, everywhere. Awesome. Awesome. Well, for my co-hosts, Michael Shepard and Jack Reese, who was obviously our special guest this week, this is The Last Round. Thanks for supporting and listening to the show. Follow us at The Last Round 12 on social media. Rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Last Round Podcast.